Do you think you have a badass kayak? Do you think it's going to turn some heads? Saturday, March 25th, Jake Spate and Tackle is hosting a kayak show and seminar. The kayak show starts at 1030. They'll be giving away $500 worth of prizes. The categories are the youth division, 18 and under, the DIY division, if you put $1,000 or less into the kayak, the best river kayak setup, the best big water kayak setup, and then the best in show. If you're interested, you can bring your kayak out. It costs $5 and all the money goes to the Frederick County Bass Club. If you're interested, email information at jakespaintandtackle.com to register. Again, email information at jakespaintandtackle.com to register. On top of that, we're going to have seminars throughout the day. At 1130, we'll have Mike Ortega talking about kayak tournament fishing. 101. At 1230, we'll have Sela Johnson talking about intro to kayak fishing. At 1.30, we'll have Josh Evans talking about rhyme and reason and how to rig the perfect kayak. And of course, Fishing the DMV will be there to live stream it. Again, that's Saturday, March 25th at Jake's Bait and Tackle. Doors open at 10.30 for the kayak show. Stay for all the seminars, the food, and watch the Bassmaster Classic. We'll see you there. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and I had the pleasure of meeting this individual at the Dale City uh, Fishing Flea Market. Uh, Joe, who, uh, I guess, do you run or did you found the uh, VKAE? Oh, so kind of both. Um, Thomas, thanks for having me first off. Uh, love being uh, watching and, and listening to all of the things you've got going on um but but yeah for sure um i don't think i found it i think it was a discussion between me and a couple other uh kind of staff members team members that we have we talked about starting a multi-species club in northern virginia um that would kind of um mirror what the bass community does as far as like tournaments and organization and kind of outreach as far as uh, maybe some charity stuff. Um, a lot of that goes on and you usually see it within the bass community, the bass angler community, um, which are, you know, they're very prevalent in, in anywhere you go. So I was wondering if, you know, if we could do that with a multi-species group that didn't always just par- target bass and didn't label themselves as bass anglers, they label themselves as anything anglers. So that's kind of where I was probably the forefront of saying, let's, let's see what this looks like. Um, this is, it didn't, and we're still, we still don't know. Uh, this is, this is the beginning of what a multi-species uh, kind of club looks like. Um, and we're excited to see what happens this year in 2023. When did you have this thought? Like, like I guess set the stage a little bit to like how this came into fruition was this just like you were jogging down the street one day and it just it just yeah. hit you like a bolt of lightning or was this a, a, a couple of friends in you in you this so that's a great question and it's perfect for for the lead into this is because what sparked all this was the northern snakehead what we looked at was we saw in 2020 and 2021 this huge outbreak of not an outbreak but kind of an organizing of snakehead anglers um, within those couple of years and um, we were fortunate enough to have uh, kayak bass fishing came in and supported a snakehead kind of challenge throughout that year and a tournament that was like a a, kind of like a championship and they actually had it right here in stafford virginia here on in north in northern virginia so what that did was and i don't want to get too far ahead but what that did was it kind of gave me the idea i'm like okay so we have this multi-species uh demand that's specifically for for northern snakehead and um but that's no different than what's been going on in every else every other place in the world for other species that aren't bass right so you think about it you've got pike you've got muskie up north you've got catfish all over the country you've got inshore water uh targeting redfish uh speckled trout, whatever the case may be, right? You have all these other multi-species and then you've got like crappie, you've got walleye, you've got um, goggle eye in the Midwest. You've got all kinds of different species that people are specifically targeting and call themselves multi-species anglers, but they also bass fish, right? They also do all these other things, but they also are bass anglers as well. And I was wondering if like, why, why are we saying now we're Northern snakehead anglers? 
And what the difference was is that northern northern snakehead anglers were just kind of this culminating event that was happening. It was um, something very new in our region, in the Mid Atlantic region. So you look at all the places you cover: Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. Um, you can reach this type of species of fish now, and um, it, it just it was interesting to me to think that we were going to like pinpoint that we were we were all like this northern snakehead species angler when really we were just a multi-species angler. So I wanted to kind of open that up and say like like I, I get you love snakehead fishing, and I love I love that the fact that that probably brought you into fishing along with probably the pandemic. Um, because everybody started fishing then too. There's a huge uh, influx of people that started kayak fishing, bank fishing, just to get outdoors because of the pandemic. So I thought it was interesting to, to think that it was just Northern snakehead. I don't think it was. I think it was something that um, they think they are just Northern snakehead anglers, but really you're a multi-species angler. If you really kind of expand yourself beyond, beyond uh, snakehead fishing, you probably find something you really yeah, snakehead fishing really is a gateway drug for anglers, especially the ones in this area. And it's such a fascinating, I can't wait in 10 years when they actually do like a historical piece on all this because it is yeah. so fascinating. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, when, you, when you listen to Odenkirk, I know we did we did a YouTube episode about that about a year ago. And then he sure. did a, um, I think he did a little seminar with NVKVA okay. three weeks ago. Just recently, talk yeah. About some more? Y- yeah. And it's so fascinating to watch this arc of this thing that was vilified. They made movies about it, and it created such a cult following. It is yeah. insane, the cult following that came around the snakehead. And like I said earlier, it being a gateway drug, it's brought so many people into fishing that probably wouldn't do it at all. Right, right. Absolutely. So, like, um, and that's kind of the the code that's hard to crack. You know, you've got a, you've got new anglers that are very good northern snakehead anglers right whether they do it from the bank or whether they do it from a a canoe or whatever they do it from it doesn't matter really they do they're doing it from multiple angles of of fishing which is unique to the fact that we're trying to uh kind of target well if we can put this in a competition perspective what do you how do you target this so what was happening in my mind um for the past couple years was you would have these tournaments that were kind of broad and open, open wide waters. Didn't matter what you were, where, where or who you, what you were fishing from, whether it be a kayak, the bank, or a boat, uh, John boat, didn't matter. Um, and, but we had this unique thing that was this virtual catch photo release tournament management system. And there's, I think, five out there now that are pretty predominant that you can, uh, log into GPS and all these other things to where you can track where these individuals are actually fishing from. So that kind of gives them an opportunity to police what is actually happening in these tournaments. And, but I, what I, what I didn't like about it was there's still a lot of risk that goes along with, if you're going to, you know, put your money down on a tournament and say, I'm going to enter this tournament and say, uh, I, I think I can do really well catching fish, but it's a five state wide or a six state wide um, tournament rules to where it doesn't really matter where you're fishing from. There's, there's really a lot of, you just got to put a lot of fun and faith into it. Right. Mm -hmm. You just got to say, okay, yeah, let's see what happens. Because I think there's a lot of, uh, risk that, that, uh, uh, angler is going to take as far as entering a tournament like that. So what we were looking at from VKE's perspective was let's kind of condense that to some of the rules that have already been done for many, many years from the bass community. Right. So if you look at, and you're very familiar with, Mm. with, uh, yeah, you're very familiar with, you know, the, the bass, you know, the bass boat community. Right. So they Mm -hmm. all launch from the same launch. They all fish in the same waters. Um, Obviously they have the capability to maneuver amongst a wide range of waters um, that let's say a kayak wouldn't, but, at the same time, there are some you're you're minimizing the risk of of anybody probable possibility of cheating. And when it came to snakehead, what was interesting was is that um, the fish is being found in, in various amounts of waters throughout our region, and, and we already talked about that what those regions are. To where, it, and I don't want to like downplay it, but almost in a ditch level type water system, right? To where you can catch them 
you know, at, at the size of, 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 of 30 plus inches in a, in a ditch on the side of the road. So to me, that's not competition fishing. If you, if that water is eligible because it's connected to a, a, a let's say a, a tidal water a system that's eligible water because it's connected to me, that's not really competitive fishing. So I wanted to kind of condense that. And I think that's kind of where VKE has kind of brought this into perspective. It'll say, uh, if you're going to do a competition, let's kind of compartmentalize it a little bit and see if we can bring everybody in. And I really don't know if it'll work or not. I really don't know. I know that it works for bass anglers. Bass anglers are a different species of, of people. Um, bass anglers are very uh, in tune with what they want to do. And, and they're willing to spend the money and time and effort to go and be a competition bass angler. Multi-species anglers, and when I say that, that's everybody else minus probably fly fishing guys that's everybody else that's inshore guys that's uh catfish guys that's you know walleye guys up north or pike guys up up, up north so um northern northern snakehead has changed the dynamics of how we're going to look at um fishing in our region especially from a competition perspective is what i would say how, do, how does the scoring work if you're doing a multi-species event how does that actually play out in a tournament format so um, I don't think I've dabbled into the idea of doing a multiple species tournament. Um, when I say multi-species, I'd say it's just, it's not a, a, a largemouth black bass. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. 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 Yeah. Um, there are tournaments out there and there's a few out there. If you did, if you kind of just played around and like say fish and chaos or tournament X, you'll see there's, there's a couple clubs out there that do kind of like a slam where there's three mm -hmm. different types of species going on. Um, and there are rules applied to each different species, which again, you start getting it like, I don't, man, I don't know how people get anglers to read that stuff because I have a hard time getting anglers to read just the snakehead rules. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but it is a fascinating idea because you do think of like the, the classic one would be like the Florida grand slam which i think is like a tarpon permit and bonefish on the flats then you have the backwater slam which is like a redfish snook and speckled trout and, a trout. and so you get right. these really cool ideas and concepts and and when you say multi-species that got me thinking like what would your grand slam be in tidal water That's a great, oh man so i'm glad you brought that up so let's so i'm a very uh i'm a tidal water guy i'm a potomac rappahannock river guy i'm gonna be straight up with you that's my predominant freshwater fish fishing areas that I fish. And then when I go inshore, it's predominantly right out the, the exit of the Potomac, the Rappahannock, or I'm in Virginia beach. So I'm, I'm a straight Virginia guy. I fish all the waters that everybody talks about. Um, what's interesting is I, I tried to figure out what is the freshwater slam. Let's say in Prince William, Stafford, Spotsylvania County, right? Is it a gar carp and catfish? Come on, Thomas, tell me if it is. That would actually be pretty insane. Gar, Could gar, you catch fish. three of the, those three things? On a fly, possibly, right? Like, <laughs> how could you catch a carp? Yeah, gar on the... Yeah, I mean, that one... I mean, that would be a very doable one from the shore, too. The Potomac or, Slam. Is that the Potomac Slam? I guess that'd be like the Trash Fish Slam, too. Depending it would on definitely your, be a trash slam. viewpoint. <laughs> right, it would definitely be a trash... So, like, so we could, you know... Like, I don't, we haven't labeled any of that. And, and there's a lot of labeling going on in the past couple of years. The, the snakehead has been labeled. If you catch a 30, 30 inch snakehead or better, that's a dragon, right? Dragon. Mm -hmm. um, and then if he's, if that fish, that fish actually can be less than um, 30 inches and still weigh double digits. So 10 plus and vice versa. The fish is, is strange. It's sometimes you can catch them, you know, in, in reverse of that. But that's also considered a dragon. So 10 plus pounds is a dragon, 30 plus the, inches. The is branding, dragon. though, for this thing, if you were its PR agent, what they did, like, again, like, what is the big one called? It's a dragon. It's a dragon. The way it looks, it's aesthetically pleasing. I, I mean, it's such a, a great fish from a PR standpoint. It got so much press. It's so cool to catch them. You know, compared to like, you know, we mentioned carp and catfish. You know, if, if I say a snakehead angler, you have images that pop in your head. If I say catfish or carp angler, you have images that pop in your head. And that to me, it's just so fascinating how in 10 years, this 
this creature has made such a niche for itself. And again, I keep going back to that, but it's it's so hard to get that kind of press and to market it that way. And it's stuck in people's eye because it is. If I put a thumbnail saying you're catching dragons, that thing will, will run a lot faster than do anything else. It just yeah. does. Um, yeah, I mean, like I would also think for an idea for for a grand slam would be probably what like striper. Like cause you're talking about the Chesapeake to being how brackish what striper blue, puppy drum, and then largemouth snakehead. And then blank, like that, that. I don't know. That is interesting because no one talks about that up here. Is like the different grand slams you could catch. Yeah. So down in down in towards closer towards the Chesapeake Bay, um, regardless of what river you're ending up in, those guys have kind of already dubbed that as a slam being could 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 range between a red, a a, a, a trout, and either a flounder or a striper. So there's one oh. or the other, yeah. Flounder or a striper is considered a Chesapeake slam, um, and it, and they take that kind of. I think we kind of stole that from Florida. Florida's got the same deal with red trout, but they have a snook that they can catch where we have we ha- they can't catch a striper like we can a rockfish. So that is so freaking cool. Yeah. I had um when I talked to uh to Mike and Alex of the DWR when I went down to Richmond for that. Uh, Mike actually did some of his doctorate work in Georgia. And so he was very learned in like, I think there's like six or seven bass species in Georgia. Like, yeah. like of course, the, you know, the Coosa bass. And like, I thought that is so fascinating because of different challenges you can do that aren't tournament fishing. Um, <clears throat> and I'm a little scatterbrained right now, but like, so like Deep Creek Lake, this guy that I interviewed last year, he talked about how like he just tries to catch as many citations as possible that's a neat little goal that and is it's the goal. same yeah and, and, and it's so interesting because we do get so much into just bass fishing is the only way that you can fish and that's not true at all there's so many different ways that you there can is. actually go enjoy the outdoors like what what you're doing here with your club now one of the rules i did want to know like if you're gonna if i was gonna go compete in this like how, like how many snakehead do i want to catch do we doing inches we're doing weight are we doing a bump board like what are we doing yeah so um Great question. So we we've we've kind of I, I tried to keep it down to the the standard of what is already known and which is what uh, catch photo release bass tournaments are already doing, which is you know they have a certain number of fish that you catch. They're using specific boards um, to do that on, and um, the, how you're catching them obviously is 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 from a either. Now, the most popular right now, besides from probably what you're used to, you know, from a bass boat, is the kayak version. I think we're the next mm-hmm. step down. So w- what we did was we made this just a straight kayak version of tournament fishing. Um, but you do. it's So unfortunately, believe it or not, after two and a half years of tournament fishing for snakehead in, uh, in these kind of open bordered, broad tournaments that have been happening so i'm competing with guys in delaware maryland new jersey so cool. right we found that virginia doesn't produce um more than uh three or four snakehead a day from a really 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 good snakehead angler um, why if you're, if you're catching more than if you catch four more than four or more f- snakehead a day consistently you're you're in not a honey hole you're in like the hole you're in like heaven hole um, it's why be- because the Potomac River and the, tri- the tributaries that we fish in Virginia are very broad and specific to it's it's open waters basically you've got you know if I go so I'll take this for in- for instance so everyone knows Aquia Creek right that's been on Instagram that's been on YouTube for I think since 2016 about being a hot spot in Stafford County um, what's different about St- Aquia Creek, then let's say those smaller areas up north where they have very specific targeted, and I don't want to, I'm not trying to um, sound disrespectful to up there, but they have smaller waters. They're almost like ditches to where they're, mm. the fish are kind of in pools. Um, we're fishing actual tributaries like you would for bass fishing, right? Like you go out and you're hunting for fish. You're, you're trying to search for fish. You're doing. You're using techniques to search for fish to find a bite. That's what we're doing with with snakehead here in Virginia because we have such open waters. But also, we're also dealing with that jet ski recreational guy that goes by that messes up my waters, or you know, um, somebody who's bow fishing um, at the same time that I'm out there in the tournament. So 
there's a little bit of difference between the access to the to the to the fish uh, we have here in Virginia than there is probably in other areas I think up north. So I would that's that's how I'll leave it with that. Are, are snakehead more like bass and crappie that they are a fish that will school up and congregate? Or are they more like musky where they're lone predators and they're singular targets? I think I. So my opinion is, um, from my experience in, in Tarita and for the past, I think six years now, they're more of a, um, it's more of a singular target. I don't, I've not seen where they've schooled up. I've not seen where um, you're going to catch multiple fish in an area um, just because they happen to be there and you've kind of figured that, that kind of technique out. Um, if you, if you did catch multiple fish in an area, I think it's luck. I think they just mm. happen to be two fish there and and you didn't spook the other one while you were catching the first one. Um, that's my opinion. Now, again, we're, we're dealing with different water conditions. We're dealing with different things going on in Virginia than what they may be dealing with, uh, you know, across the street over in Blackwater or up North and North and in, in New Jersey, they may have deeper waters. They may have deeper things going on. They may have different conditions, water temperatures, whatever, just like with bass fishing. I think there's a, I think there's a significant difference between catching a, a, a snakehead in Virginia than there is catching a snakehead in Maryland or, or any other state in our region now at this point. Before, when we were looking at this, I would, I would even say it's not very far off, maybe five years ago, we were all looking at it the same. We were all saying, oh, this is how you catch them. And it was probably very accurate because they're a very aggressive fish. They'll hit a lot of topwater baits. They'll hit a lot of Anything that's a reaction bait, they're very uh, attuned to hitting those those type of baits and you getting cooked up to them. But I think as we start to get into more of a elongated version of them being here in the United States, I think we're going to find that they've conditioned. And I think we're going to find that you're going to have to start uh, pinpointing as an angler, especially a competition angler, you're going to have to start pinpointing what you're actually doing to try to catch that fish. Now, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I'm just trying to pattern it in my head when you think of, you know, if you're taking a quiet, which is a great example where it's a very broad creek, and then you have a predator that is very much a singular creature, like a muskie versus a crappie. Um, that would make sense why going to these other areas that probably aren't as pressured, but are also smaller and tighter, it makes your probability of finding them a lot easier. It does. Yeah. Yeah. And it, there's never going to be a struggle, I think, to find them. I think they're always going to be in the areas that we we are very in tune with knowing they're going to be in, which is a lot of cover, very shallow water. They like warm water. They like we we have all the information uh, that we need to target them. But whether you get them to bite or not in pressured areas, I think is something new that anglers aren't willing to accept, which is leading to some of this conversation about how we've killed them all off and there's there's spot burning and things of that nature. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the information that I'm hearing now is, um, you know, well, in 2017, 16, 16, 15, 16, 17, I was catching four dragons a day. Okay. That's probably very true because there wasn't a whole bunch of people fishing for them then because you were probably very new to that information and where they were at. Now that we've all kind of figured out where they're where they're at there's a few more people fishing for them and they've they've started to condition to that uh information i think the fish has and now that we've gotten into this information sharing of now now you've burned my spot i'm like well i don't know if we've burned your spot i just think that the fish is just really hard to catch at this point yeah and and i want to talk about the bow hunting too at some point because that's come up in about four or five conversations um but the one thing i want to add to that is like a great example this is forward facing sonar um Halliker had a report that came out on lake frederick and talked about how like you know there's it seems like there's stunted growth there's not a lot of fish but then when you piece the puzzles together that we have done over the past year here at fishing the dmv where it's like you have blueback herring the fish are now pelagic there's no grass and then all these guys started bringing forward facing sonar this past three months and they've caught sevens, eights, fours, yeah. fives. And before people are like, well, no, they're just, they don't exist anymore. It's like, no, their, their habits and their patterns have changed. are still there. Do you feel like some of these big dragons are still in Virginia waters, but they have just, they're, they're educated now. They're still there. They haven't been killed off. They're just educated. I do. I, I, I think they are there. I think now are they at a disadvantage to get killed off because of 
because of the opportunity of bow fishing, yes, I do think that that, that opportunity is there. And to where typically if that was if you eliminate that, then that dragon will because of his smarts and his intelligence and survival skills has survived that season will live longer. I think for sure he has, he's at a disadvantage because bow fishing of the, in, of that species is open. So, um, I'm, I'm, I don't want to bash bow fishing at all because I think that's done enough. Um, I think we all know what it does. I think they, we all know there's no reason to, to reiterate or well, re regurgitate what, what they do. What What is your opinion on all that? Because it, it is a fascinating thing that I didn't know about till I started this podcast that it was so hot. And, and I think that's what's so interesting when, you know, I, I don't know. And maybe it's because it, it, it's, it's so, it's so tribal and everything is so yeah. siloed now where unless you cross over to that other group, you don't know about what they're dealing with. I right. didn't know about these issues on the Rappahannock until I started talking to people on the Rappahannock about this. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, was bow fishing always there? And now I just realize it? Or is it that because now that you have snakehead, there is more bow fishing? So I think it's the latter. I think um, I think bow fishing has always been a sport that, uh, you know, locals have always been in tune with, which is fine. You know, whatever their, whatever their rules are that they can, whatever species of fish that they can target has always been there and has been prevalent. However, when snakehead was introduced and they become predominant in the river, it became, and, and now it, and, and for some bow fishermen that are profiting from the kill, which is taking them to um, grocery stores and things like that, whatever that distributor is that they can connect with to sell to, there's a, there's a monetary value to it now. So that has motivated, I think, more bow fishermen to invest in bow fishing equipment and boats and lights and things of that nature mm, in time. Okay. Right. Makes so sense. now it's, you've kind of, you've kind of, uh, you know, kind of rejuvenated what was just a kind of a normal river fishing kind of, you know, a guy that goes out in gigs or, or bow fishes, not a big deal. He just gets a few river fish and brings them home. What you have is this, um, kind of ex excited uh, version of let's go out and kill a whole bunch of snakehead because they're worth money. Um, and, and you, and I won't insult your intelligence. You know, that that brings in a lot of things. You know? Yeah. And, and guys, just so that I want to make sure that I'm, I'm speaking plain. So allegedly the idea is like bow fishing has gotten extremely bad in these. And again, everything I'm saying is allegedly uh, if a bow fisherman would like to come on the show, I always, I try to get everyone's opinion, whether it's the flathead, I'll get a flathead guy on, which I have had, or I'll get a bow fisherman on. Um, and when I have Odenkirk on this summer, again, I'm going to talk to him about this, but bow fishing has been an issue, not just for the snakehead, but again, allegedly they're also shooting bass too. They're just shooting whatever they yeah. can shoot. And then again, because I don't have tangible evidence, I'm not going to say that that's fact or not, but I'm yeah. just saying that's what some of the rumors are. Um, if that is the case, there should be something done about that. But I, again, because so many times tribes can be create so much drama that's fake. I don't know. Cause I don't have tangible right. evidence, but again, it is interesting that that's, but again, like to me, it came back to the point, like I just said earlier, it's like, it, why am I hearing about this now and not when, not four or five years ago? And I think it is because the snake had made it more profitable, possibly. It did. I think so. Yeah. Profitable. And it's a great eating fish. Maybe they're, mm -hmm. I'd love to, I would love to believe that they're all just eating the shit out of them <laughs> because mm -hmm. that would, that would just make me feel better because um, I hear a lot of horror stories about how they're being dumped at the, at the docks when they, you know, after, after they get back to the ramp and just throwing them out or whatever. Um, that seems kind of wasteful to me. Um, I, and I would not promote that at all. And I don't want that to be part of, you know, what I I'm part of. And especially because I'm a hook and line guy, if you're going to go out and just, you know, just whack them and just dump them, dude, man, you're, you're, you're hooking up. You're not hooking me up. Man. And that's not, mm -hmm. that's not fun. So, um, let's, let's kind of find a happy medium between the, between the two, because I, I, I come from a, a, a line of hunting and, and, and fishing boats. So I understand that there's a love for, you know, going out and shooting stuff. I, I'm not, I'm not taking that yeah. away yeah, hundred percent, um, by no means, but I think there's a certain value that, that should be, uh, in, imposed on those that are like, Hey man, come on. Like, don't, don't take it to a limit to where it's just obnoxious. Um, there's, the rest of us want to have some fun too. It, it is so fascinating, the snakehead thing, especially with, 
you know, example, the big thing now apparently is the Alabama bass and yeah. how people reacted to both. Um, <laughs> it, it is because like, if you go, the, the big three will probably be the blue cat, the, the snake head, and then you take Alabama, Alabama. I feel like the majority of people are in lockstep, get rid of it. We don't want it here. Yeah. Then, then you have the blue cat, which is a little bit more meh. Some people are okay with it. The cat guys, other people, absolutely. You know, that's more split. Then you have snake head where it is. It, it's, it's kind of weird because there's a lot of people that are like, no, we kind of want it. We want to get it protected. And, right. and I know that there's a big push about that. And that's just to me is fascinating how you have three invasives and you have three different kind of tribal arguments over the thing. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm 100% agree with you. And I'm not a biologist, so I'm not going to get yeah. into the, the depth of what the difference between the, the three are. But I can just the tell cultural that, thing. Yeah, just I can tell you that it's just funny that how, uh, especially kind of getting into the social media stuff, you know, how people have their opinions about those those three different things. And mm. the, the thing is, is that a snakehead is probably at the bottom of the three when it comes to, you know, disrupting any, any type of ecosystem in any body of water that you have, um, you know, the blue cat is, dude, I, I've, I lived all over the country. I've fished the Midwest, the West coast, um, Florida, you know, the, so the Southern East coast. And then I've lived up here, um, for close to 10 years now, um, in, in different times of my life. Really? I've never caught and I've, I've fished for catfish, right? But I've never caught a catfish on a crankbait until I move here on the Potomac River. And I catch them all the time on a crankbait, catch, mm -hmm. trying to catch freaking bass and win a tournament. I'm catching catfish. It's the only place I ever catch blue cats. So to me, if you were going to ask my opinion, that's my opinion. There's there's my evaluation of, of, of you know 40 plus years of fishing across the entire United States in my entire time. The only time I ever catch a blue cat is when I'm throwing a crankbait. So that's kind of weird. You might want to think about what's, what that's it, doing. It, it is. And again, like this is another conversation when I get another biologist on, why is it not working here? And and so again, just from the why aspect is the new river, uh, flathead are native to the new river. They don't have an issue with flathead, musky, walleye, smallmouth. They live in harmony. Why is it this place that's so effed with the blue cats? Because it's mm -hmm. a big body of water. You have the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Yeah, it, it's it, great. I, it's so confusing why it, it didn't balance out. But that, that, that's a that's a great one. Like I hope I hope the science starts figuring that out because I, I think um, John Odenkirk actually kind of talked about that a little bit about how why why does it work so well here that they just you know blew up because mm -hmm. they didn't blow up everywhere else. So yeah. But it is fast. To, yeah. Yeah. It's easy to blame everybody that it blew up, but it, I don't think. We yeah. That. And, and, and it happened. It's not that like it, it wasn't purposely done again. It was like not to try to, and Odenkirk does a great job about talking about this too, guys. I'll actually link that, um, that, that earliest conversation he did about the catfish and the snakehead too, in the episode description of this. Cause it, again, he's a fantastic speaker. He is. So um, I, so I, so I don't have, I mean, John's not here with us, but man, I like every time I, I'm, I look around, I see John Odenkirk's name either thrown out there that he purposely does, or he's doing interviews, interviews of, you know, with like, like he did with you recently, um, or with NVKBA. Does, do not like, is he, well, he's like special? Does he like the only guy that does that? I don't, I don't see other states having the guy like a John Odenkirk supporting their areas. And I think it's just fantastic thing i want to point out that like dude i think we're special to have a guy like him that's been around for 20 plus years just promoting all of the information giving it all out giving it to the anglers giving it to the you know constituents of the state um i just think it's great i don't i don't see that anywhere else he he broke the mold honestly and then i want to give props to to the different ones like benarski alex and then um Halliker as well but i will have to say like i think he broke the mold about getting out there he was on meat eaters for a couple of episodes uh but again he was like the right place right time where he was the head of the task force for the snakehead when it became this international craze too that's right that's right um, yeah but god he needs to write a biography because it's so interesting <laughs> to go from the guy that, that did this day one to where he's kind of like 50, 50 on what the snakehead point in the ecosystem is. And that's fascinating for him to have that opinion when he's the guy for the DWR 
to do it. Um, anyway, they, hey, yeah, I mean, I could, it's so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. Like I, I think the guy's great. I've never met him. I've heard, I've listened to him hundreds of thousands of times on different things that he talks about. And I think he's just uh, man, like every state needs a John Odenkirk. I think. Yes. Him. Yes. And, and they need to get out there and just communicate about everything that's going on and what they're trying to do just to kind of break down some of this doc talk. I mean, speaking of doc talk, like how much, when you pitch this club and even right now, how much crap is there out there against what you're doing? Cause you're basically doing a catch to the person that doesn't know. You're basically doing a catch and release tournament for invasive species is one way people could interpret that. Yeah. Are, are you getting a lot of blowback or is it pretty much everyone's receiving it very well? Yeah. You know, so um, that's a great question. I've not got any blowback. I, there, there were some kind of, I predetermined, uh, kind of How about questions drama? I knew. Yeah, there was <laughs> there was some predetermined drama that I knew was coming when I posed this idea with 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 my guys, and when we threw it out there and said, "Here's what we're gonna do," boom. And uh, the first one was, and and, and it's spe- and snakehead specific. I hate to keep beating on the snakehead stuff, but can I harvest my fish when I'm you know when I'm tournament fishing? So that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about competition fishing. Like these are, we're talking about brand new people that are getting into fishing. And then we're getting talking about a a, a population of people that are just now first time competition fishing. So my, my response immediately having, because I'm someone who is competition fished for bass for several years, I'm like, no, nah, man, it's 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 a tournament. Mm-hmm. Like, you're not, you're not, I'm not taking him home for a fish fry tonight. Like, I'm just, but I understand your question because it is an invasive species. So, so that's where kind of the the lines start getting blurry. Is you got these invasive species laws. You got these things you can do if you can or can't do if you want to if you want to uh, harvest the fish. So I had to look at the depth of what did I want to allow and what I didn't want to allow. And if I allowed it, how much more, how many more rules I'd have to create to police it? And how hard would it be for me to police if they did harvest a fish in a competition, you know, environment? So, so that's one, that's, that's number one. And number two is, um, yeah, just, uh, snakehead fishing in general, you're still going to get your, they need to die. They're killing all the bass. I'm a bass fisherman. Please get rid of them. You shouldn't even have anything. You know, this should be a kill type thing. So that was the that was number two. I, I have I've had a lot of uh, um, not not hate email, but it's it, it it comes up. It, it it does come up in comments to me directly about why snakehead are still around. And it, what I will say to you, Tom, it's just before and not to take up too much of this, but. Huh. Um, over the past three years, just 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 let's say you know you know three years time, it's gone from, hey, what are you fishing for when I'm at the at the boat landing, you know, picking up for the night, snakehead or bass, whatever I can. Oh, you fish for snakehead? You should kill those things. That's what it was in 2017 and 18. In 2020, 2022, 2023. That same question gets asked to me, and it's like, "Hey, what are you catching? Well, I'm. Well, what are you? What are you after? Well, snakehead or bass or whatever I can get a hold of." And it's usually, "Oh, did you get any snakehead? Do you mm. eat those guys? Do you eat those guys? Are they any good?" And I and uh, and then I'll then I'll start you know engaging with them conversationally about what I believe about snakehead and what they're doing to the bass and all of the other ecosystem and things of that nature. So it's, it's, it has lightened up over the years to a different conversation to where it's more of you can have a conversation and it's not this, you know, kind of black and white, you need to kill it, I'm not going to kill it type thing to where, hey, are you killing it? No, I don't kill it. Let's talk about it. So it is what it is. That shows you the evolution and growth, though. Uh, again, the cultural zeitgeist around this thing, and, and I think it's reflected in that this club is, you know, it, it is where it is today. Um, and it sounds like, I guess, the DWR on on the Maryland and Virginia side, they're oh, they, you didn't get any call from the feds, I guess, either no. when you said you were going to do this tournament. No, 
No, and I don't think I will. I think um, we're we're a legitimate, you know, business within Virginia, the state of Virginia. We've done all the things that we need to do uh, legally. And what I, what I would love to uh, expose tonight is, you know, we are a five hundred one three nonprofit, so we are actually trying to raise money towards uh, specific charities. If we can, if we can raise enough money um, through our tournaments, um, a lot of a lot of clubs do that. Not not anything special, but um, when you're talking about something that's new and fresh like we are, it's a multi-species club. I don't expect us to get much bigger than a 30, a 30 club paid entry uh, uh, size club. I, I expect our Facebook club, which is just you can be a Facebook fan all you want to be, you know, up in the, you know, probably thousands but when you start getting into who's actually fishing and, and wanting to contribute to what, what's going on and, and competing in these tournaments, it's about 30 people um, in my region. And I'll be honest with you, I'm good with that. Well, I don't want to get any bigger than that because well, yeah. it's more work for me. I was going to say, though, but like, so you're saying 30 now. How many was it year one? So this is year one, Thomas. Yeah, this, so this is, is year one. Time. We just started. Well, that's pretty freaking awesome then to start with 30, which means yeah. good God, this thing could blow the hell up. Yep. Absolutely. It, like, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> so <laughs> so I've, I've got a crew where we have the original VKA guys. We, um, we are a combination of, of anglers throughout the, uh, we're all from, we're all from uh, Northern Virginia, but we've all been part of different multi-species groups, uh, whether it be inshore or snakehead or whatever the case may be, even bass. Um, we all came together and said, let's do something that's kind of a mixed bag. And um, we kind of didn't really care if it did, if it took off, but we knew that there was a group of people that were willing to say, let's, let's, let's just go after the snakehead in our region. I don't have to do the, the virtual thing that's up in Delaware or, you know, 5,000 miles away from me that I don't really know if I won or I didn't win. Let's do something local. Let's, let's do something. Let's all meet together at one ramp. Let's all shake hands, eat honey buns in the morning and drink coffee and say, all right, let's blow the whistle. Go. Let's all fish for eight hours and I'll come back. Let's all do the combination of who won and hand a trophy off and shake hands and go off with our day. We wanted to do that at the community level. So for me, the love is I did it at the community level and I want to keep it at the community level. If it gets any bigger than this, Thomas, I'm going to lose interest in it because let somebody else do that shit. Because no, man, but th that's yeah. a good that's a good question. Then, like, are you going to cap it at thirty, or like, what is your? I mean, clearly, you're going to grow. I mean, like, you're going to get more people that are interested. So, like, what is your plans then? To be like, nope, it has to stay at thirty, or do you think you're going to like have leeway? Or yeah, like, what is the the long term thought there? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think I've got there yet. And I, I kind of <laughs> like that. I know. And so, <laughs> so um, being, you know, twenty five years in the military, I've had a lot of stuff kind of laid out in front of me, and, and you, you, you got a lot of things that you're supposed to aim for. And the beauty of the, all of this is that this is what I love to do. I've been fishing from all my life. I finally have a grasp of something that I can control, and my control is no control. Uh, that if my community doesn't tells me that they don't want to play no more, then I don't want to play no more with you. Let's just go gotcha. have a beer and, and a hot dog somewhere together and let's just go fish. Because if we don't want to play this game that we've got, that we've presented for ourselves, let's not do it. And I tell you, it's not just my crew. I've got a crew of about seven dudes um, that are VKAE staff that are, that are locals, but I've got four, I think four other groups that they dub themselves, you know, and one of them that comes to mind is the party at crew. Man. Those guys, there's like five guys. They all fish together every day. Whenever they go fishing, they're always together. They're always in our tournaments. And um, those guys, I have to throw a shout out to them because, you know, like every time I want something from them, they give it to me. So every time um, they want to go fish a tournament, they're, they're always there with us. So I, I, I can't help but say that, you know, that's part of the community that I'm looking for. Anything more than that, screw it, man. If it doesn't work, I don't care. I'm going to go fishing anyway. I'm going to post my shit on Instagram. Let's go. So then just to make sure there's clarity, uh, if people that are listening to this would like to join the club, is there openings for them to be able to come join in? Oh, absolutely. So okay. we, we, we didn't put any cap on anything. Um, 
we're we're around i think i think up to this point and we're about a month out from our first tournament uh, the you have to be a club member um which is um has a fee to that and then there's a fee to to fish the four different tournaments that we host um for the snakehead trail so that's that's snakehead specific um tournaments and um just like the bass trail we have a, associated a angler of the year kind of point system to go along with that so i was hoping that would kind of kind of trigger some um guys that weren't familiar with that or guys or gals that were familiar with you know if you do a certain amount of of trail tournaments in a row or within the certain scope of the rules that you earn certain points and if you do certain if you place uh, at a certain specific uh uh hierarchy then you ab- absolutely you're going to start earning some higher points so, so let's get into we did that the, now we did the same thing yeah so um so i guess we'll go. start you want to go we'll go left to right so uh so your first tournament then is in april correct yeah so there we are yeah perfect man so um on the website it doesn't say the actual dates we didn't want to expose it too worldly gotcha. but but uh, but obviously uh, I can tell you here you know April fifteenth is our first um, Snakehead Trail which is our our tr- Snake Trail one um, it's going to be at Aquia Creek and it's a single launch um, type tournament it's no it's not open borders um, you will have your board checked at by by myself or one of my other uh, compadres and we will um, deliver your uh, identification card for that tournament so no games played at this point you'll go out and fish you'll you'll come back and then whoever wins wins hmm. and then on snakehead two uh snake trail two we've got rep, rep the rappahannock river we're actually going to meet at um somewhere in port royal um we there's really only one place at port royal that you can meet as a group but there are two different uh launch points that are uh, reasonably within each other. So I think we can use both of them. And then Snake Trail 3 will be a Potomac River um, um, tributary up a little bit north of where I'm from, which is in Prince William County and Leesylvania. And there we have not quite decided whether or not we can use, there's two tributaries that are very close to each other, uh, Nabasco and um, what's the other one? Shook me real quick. Potomac anyway, Creek. There's a there's another um I think Angemoin? it's Powell's. Powell's, Powell's Creek. Creek. Okay. Powell's That's Creek. What you're talking about. Yeah, Powell's Creek and Pato- and, and Nebasco Creek are very close to each other. There's kind of one kind of island that kind of separates the two. Um that'll be this that'll be the third place. And then what our goal is is to have you have to fish at least two of those three to qualify to enter the, the, the Chana classic. And when you get into the Chana classic, that's where we're going to have all of our sponsors gear that they've donated to us and, and the cash prizes that they donated to us. Uh, cool. That's where we're going to relieve all of those to those winners. If you make it now, we don't actually know where the Chana Classic is going to be. Yet. So if somebody wants to enter the first tournament, it, it, when is there a cutoff date that they have? To, is it like the day of, is it, two weeks beforehand what what is the cutoff yeah so we use the the standard um fishing chaos if anybody who's who's fished with fishing chaos you'll know, you realize that a lot of times the standard is like it's usually the night before um i think it's six hours before tournament start so uh um, gotcha for, gotcha gotcha yeah for, for for april 15th i mean you have until i think nine o'clock the night before on the 14th got it so guys there's still time to sign up if you want to kind of join in on this which is this looks so and okay whoever came up with perch pounder as a title needs a raise <laughs> that is effing awesome that is a hell of a name yeah. it should be a bumper sticker that could be a meme i love that so much <laughs> yeah we're working on that so that's that's so everything left or everything right as you're looking at on your screen of the snakehead hunters tournament trail series so the the crappie challenge we're just really trying to help out, man. We're trying to figure out if we, people are going to be interested in this. We really don't know. Why there would people want to do that? Is, that is so cool. Yeah, there isn't one, right? I, I know of a gazillion real life. You can go to Lake Anna and join 
you know, crappie X, Y, or Z tournament that's going to go out that day and you can go crappie fish, right? I, I got it. I got it. Mm-hmm. But I've not seen a crappie challenge, which is very similar to the bass challenge, which is a month long who can catch the biggest crappie. So we wanted to say, let's see if we can do that here in Virginia. I know we're not in the big crappie, uh, probably region, but it's open to everybody. The snakehead tournament, the snakehead hunters tournament is a club specific tournament. The crappie challenge is not. And what I'm hoping is that I can, uh, by December, when this, when this tournament actually happens, we can get enough sponsorship to where I can kind of, um, maybe entice people to come join because of sponsorship and money and things of that nature. Dude, that's, that's really awesome. I mean, how much work was this? (sighs) I mean, it's it's not a lot of work. I I mean, you gotta, you gotta start small and and think big and you gotta put a lot of effort into anything you do to make it successful. So, yeah, I mean, I good on you for doing this because I know, like, for the tournament directors, I know people that started clubs. It's a pain in the ass. It's a lot of freaking work, <laughs> and you don't. It is, and you don't get necessarily. You you get all. It's like being an umpire. You get all the shit. You never get the praise. It is, yeah. and that's that's what it is. That's what you're signing up for, and you don't get to usually have the fun. Um, more more to the fun stuff now, because uh, I know the comment section would just light my ass up if I didn't ask like tactics and stuff for the old snakeheads. Uh, when do you really start fishing for them? I've heard rumors like it has to be above 60 degrees, above 40 degrees. And then is it more of like you just ground and pound a frog until your hands fall off and that's it? So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to let out too many secrets, but I think it's it's not a secret anymore because, I, 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 because I'm a bass angler. Like if we don't start telling people what to do, we can't start manipulating what people are, should be doing. That's what bass angling really has done over, mm-hmm. over the gazillion years that it's been around. They've taken one thing and they said, this is what you do this term this year, but next year, you know what? I want to tell you to do this different thing because this works better this year. So that's, that's really what um, is, is, is missing from multi-species fishing is that multi-species fishermen tell you the exact lure that works every time. What, is, what was that? Uh, man, there's a thing that's so funny. Like this works 60% of the time. Oh, all the, you mean all the time. Mean, what is Yeah. That? You mean Anchorman, wrong Burgundy. Anchorman, that's a, yeah. so that's Sex what Panther, I'm Sex like, Panther. The, 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 yeah, the Sex Panther, right? So the same thing as applies here. So. Well, that's so crazy. It, this is, this is fascinating. Cause when I look at comment sections all over and people are like, Oh, like I want to catch a snakehead and it's crickets bass fishing or any other sport. They'd be like, well, go here, go, go to this generic has opinions. Yeah, because everyone has opinions, born. and that's so fascinating because with snakeheads, people are so terrified, they won't even sometimes tell you a body of water, whereas other right. sports would be like, well, yeah, go to this body of water at least. I'll give yeah. you that. But snakehead fishing, hell no. I won't even tell you water to go to. It is so yeah. tight-lipped, and that's so interesting to me compared to other tribes. So there's um, there's a little bit of there's a little bit of truth to that, and the truth of that, Thomas, is the fact that they are only targeted in certain specific waters, whereas bass, you can specifically target them in multiple types of waters. So what I mean by that is, let's say that I, I live in Prince William County and I live close to Aquapon River, right? But I also live close to Burke Lake and I also live close to Potomac River. Your information applies the same to all three of those areas in my region that I can reach. Whereas if, whereas a snakehead, it's only going to apply to one of those three regions because they're only found in one of those three regions. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, so with bass, bass are found almost everywhere. So it's hard to kind of, kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, delineate the same this the effect that it has on one on this other species that you that that is very that is fish similar to a bass but they're not found as predominantly as a bass um in so, specific areas based on the conditions yeah. so so well, let me let me let's approach it this way what is the most obvious public place that people could go to try to catch their first one then that's just a complete obvious place 
so so an obvious place would be any Potomac tributary. There you along, go, guys. Yeah, along. So for Vir- Virginians, anyway, I can't speak for anyone north of yeah. DC or south of. Well, I mean, I don't think there's anything south of Colonial Beach at this point, but um, yeah, anything north of us, I'm not. I, I don't not. They can speak for themselves because they have different versions of snakehead fishing. They have different baits that they use. They have different things that they can uh, intellectually tell you mm-hmm. that I don't. I don't really want to get into because I don't give a shit. I can yeah. tell you what we do here in Virginia. And here in Virginia, DC or South, this is what we this is what we're looking for. You know, we're looking for fifty five degree waters or better. So and, okay, so fifty five degree waters, and yeah. it, this is actually what do they do in the winter time? I gotta re, I gotta go back through the Odenkirk thing. Do they just like go into suspended animation? Like, do they sink to the I, bottom? They do. I think they because they, they, they just they, shut they, off. They bury themselves in the mud. I do know that because I've caught them very very early spring. Huh. Um, and you'll catch them with like mud stuck to their sides and they like, they're gross. Wow. Um, so there's still like that Potomac mud is still stuck on them where they just kind of like burrowed themselves. And, um, but I can also tell you that I've had enough reports from enough guys that I know that even today up in, what is it? So it's March 9th. I would not go snakehead fishing at this point because I just, I think it's a waste of time. Like I'm going to go fish something else that I know I can catch because I'm a multi-species fisherman. Um, I, and I apply that to everything to include bass fishing. If, if it's hard for me to catch a bass, I'm not going to go fucking bass fishing. I'm going to go fishing for something else. So I a hundred percent agree. Yeah, absolutely. Right. But, yeah. but I love bass anglers who are dedicated to bass angling and only bass angling because they will put in that grind and play that chess game with the bass. I, I just choose not to. I will go catch something else. I'm actually just going to go down to Florida and go fishing down there because it's warmer. So <laughs> I lost track. So my, my, my point is that, so right now, like I have anglers telling me that, you know, they saw a snakehead. They were walking along whatever trail along some, whatever state uh, park that's along the Potomac or the Rappahannock. And so they saw snakehead shimmer away so th- so we know they're moving but are they eating probably not they're 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 kind of up and moving around does that mean you should go fish for them i don't personally think so but a lot of guys will go and and maybe some of them do, do get lucky enough to catch one so you just brought up a couple of thoughts and then uh, guys before uh we switch subjects a little bit one thing i'm going to link in the episode description is also joe summarily did a thing called fishing on the b side about snakeheads very good and one thing he dropped a good nugget is the fact that snakehead fishing gets prime when the bass fishing starts sucking in the summertime that's when like snakehead are the only thing that'll bite that's a great episode i'll link in the episode description but he talks about best times of years and stuff uh, and what you talked about there's a big issue with spawning with catching bass during the spawn ethically mm-hmm I know from a little bit of research I did before this episode about the specific way snakehead protect their young. Is that something that you try to avoid when you schedule tournaments? Is to like where are you about the ethics of catching them during the spawn? Because it is a very unique situation where they're very easy to catch, but then if you want to protect the species, is that the best time to do it? What are your thoughts on that? As far as protecting the snakehead spawn, like, no, we have we've not we've not really got into that, that the depth. Um, I don't think we have enough information to know exactly when that's happening. Um, I think there's ideas of when that happens. And I think there's been, from what I understand, um, and, and, and I'll rewind myself back to probably when I moved here in 2017, when, when I read that there were five spawns happening with snakehead. Wow. Now I'm reading and listening and learning that there's probably only a couple snakehead spawns that are happening. Now, those what, what happened was is those five that people were observing were five different groups of different species mm, happening. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Right, right. Which is which is very kind of in tune with bass fishing, which is also aligned with my idea of 
the fact that there are differences between a Virginia snakehead and a Maryland snakehead and a Delaware snakehead and a Pennsylvania snakehead. And you can't have a tournament that incorporates all of those. Just like you can't, just like Thomas, just like you can't, would you compete in a tournament down in Lake Fork virtually up here in Virginia? No, no. I, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, right? you, you, you have to keep it local. Um, you would, how, because it's, it's 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 two different dynamics of of understanding of how you're going to catch fish. How far north have you gone yourself personally to fish for? So for snakehead, I've not gone very far north. Um, I only know my information comes from other tournament anglers or um, other club anglers that I'm I'm, other, I'm, in, I'm in other clubs um, that are gotcha. Because you said yeah. Pennsylvania, so I didn't know. Like, oh shit, okay. Yeah, there's a few guys up there I talk with that that kind of fill me on what's going on up there. There's not, I mean, their activity is not nowhere near what it is like in Maryland, Virginia, but they do have certain uh, systems that ha- do hold snakehead. So it's it's, but it's ones and twosy compared to what we can do here in the next probably thirty days. And and then something for for people at home that want to actually do the catch and release. Is there a specific way that you like to handle them or anything etiquette wise for keeping them healthy? I know musky and trout are very dainty creatures compared to like a flathead that you can throw in the back of a pickup truck and it'll be fine for a day. But like, because I like example a snakehead. I know they will swallow a frog. Do you debarb the hooks if you're trying to trying to do catch and release? What is some good practices? No, I I, I think at and I would just give you my opinion at this point. I'm not, again, I'm not a biologist. I don't understand what, yeah, yeah. what kills or doesn't kill fish, but I can tell you that snakehead are having caught multiple different species of fish in my life. Snakehead are one of the most resilient fish as, as far as survival rate. Um, fish that I brought home to harvest, I can tell you have lived um, in the, in, in my, in the back of my, kayak just flipping around um for hours and i probably could probably drop them back in the water and they would still survive after after doing that whereas Mm -hmm. every other species that i've ever been encountered with if i just laid them in the back after about 20 minutes you can tell that they're dead you can see the the dullness of their eyes you can see a lot of things happen whereas with the snakehead it just seems to still just just be alive um so um, from a non-biologist perspective, I can say that I don't have any uh, practices that I have uh, to protect them from from catch photo release or anything like that. I think they're very, uh, I think they're very tough fish to kill. Oh, oh, and, yeah, they they yeah. they seem very hardy. But I just like it, it's interesting because I feel like the conversation will in the next you know decade switch to more of conservation with with the snakehead. And I so hope be, so. And it'd be interesting what kind of practices then that leads to um, in the communities, the snakehead communities, because, yeah, it, it is a fascinating thing to watch um, big picture as this bar keeps moving and, and the thought process behind them changes. W- what is your biggest snakehead? I don't think I ever asked you that. What is your PR? I mean, it's not that big. I think I have a 33 and a half. That's not bad. Inch fish. Yeah, I think it weighed at um, right at 14 uh, pounds equal. Um, snakehead are just like, just like bass, you know, they, they kind of spawn and spawn out. They have different processes, uh, throughout the year you catch them. So length doesn't necessarily equate to weight. Um, I've caught, um, some pretty short, uh, snakehead that I thought, uh, would, would weigh less. They actually weighed really a lot, a whole, a whole bunch and hmm. vice versa. So, um, it really depends on the time of the year when you catch them. Um, but there are, uh, I don't know, man, I, I, social media has kind of got me like crazy in the, in the head when it comes to what I know and what I don't know sometimes about snakehead, because a lot of your information is going to come from social media and because it's such a nuanced fish and a new fish, I have to do a lot of research from just social media. There's not any, I can't go to the library and, and look it up. So um, what I've found is that, you know, a lot of, a lot of bigger fish have been found down here in Virginia. Um, but earlier in the, in the kind of the exposure of them, I think about the 2015 to 2017 years, 
um, is when you'll find a lot of the bigger fishermen caught. And that might have been ahead of the bow fishing thing, all the things we talked about for the past hour. You know, it could have been ahead of all of that to kind of change the dynamics of why that fish was so big back then. But I really don't know. But I can tell you my, my biggest fish is only about 33 and a half. Um, it, was, it ranged out around 13 inches or 13 pounds, yeah. How, you mentioned the Chesapeake area, like how many, and this is cause this is something you guys fishing the DMV. This is something that hopefully this year or definitely next year, I'm going to do more weekly coverage on how many kayak opportunities are there in the Chesapeake Bay? So just like you're talking broad just, spectrum. Yeah. Like I, I don't know about that area you're in community wise for fishing for blue, you know, in Florida, there's a bunch, but I didn't, is there a community down there for that? Absolutely. So, really? Yeah. So I think that's where you and I are at a disconnect as far as what we're talking about. Um, as far as what what I believe is a multi-species angler. Because I'm a bass angler, I understand a certain version of what people believe fishing is. Mm -hmm. There is a multitude of opportunity for people to go fishing beyond bass fishing that will bring you into a multitude of species and fun and experience beyond um, all of those things that are freshwater, usually targeted anglers. Um, so, and that's one of them. Yeah. So, I, and I'm not going to, uh, Virginia beach, we live in Virginia. We're a Virginia. We should, we should predominantly expose pre Virginia beach. Um, that's on the list. That, that really multiple, is. Multiple, I mean, if you want to catch bull reds, bull reds. So bull red is beyond the slot, which is typically, what is it was last year? Um, I don't know. I've been drinking tonight. So I'm sorry. Is it plus 20 plus 30? No, it's, it's like 26. So 26, 26 yeah, yeah. plus I think is a bull. Dang. So if you catch anything beyond, so you can catch those at, from a kayak level angling perspective. Holy same, shit. Same thing with rock, <laughs> rock fish um speckled trout speckled trout anything beyond i think a 20 24 is trophy size right dude that is cobia. awesome cobia so i my goal for the past two years has been to catch a cobia from my kayak um i don't care if it's trophy or not i just want to catch a cobia but the, the, but i there's multiple people out there in the virginia beach area and uh, anglers in the virginia beach area that are much more experienced than i will ever be because I don't live there. I always say that if I ever lived in Virginia Beach, you would never see me not on the water fishing for freaking bass. What's I'm gonna the, tell you that right now. What, what's the biggest thing that you've caught that's that's a fish, not a mammal, from your kayak? Uh, oh, from my kayak? Yeah. Um, what's the biggest thing? I think it's a redfish. I think my red... Uh, no, I think it's a snakehead. Really? I think it is. I think lengthwise, maybe not weight wise. I've caught some heavy redfish, but maybe from a length perspective, because they're so long, uh, snakehead would, would probably win. It's either between a snakehead or a redfish. One of those two have won. How, where did you catch the redfish? Was it down in the Ches Chesapeake area or was it somewhere else? So that's the end of the Rappahannock. So uh, most of my crew, we fish a lot of the Rappahannock River towards the end where it reaches to Chesapeake Bay. So um, all of that area down there in the northern neck, um, all of those creeks and channels that you can find, um, that's where we fish when it comes to inshore fishing. Because that's kind of the closest for us. If we really are getting serious and you really want to spend a couple of days, which we do a lot of, uh, my crew, uh, we have no problem with renting an Airbnb for, two, for a weekend and going fishing in Virginia Beach. Um, we really base that off of conditions. Um, which is really what's important because it's a lot of money you spend going down there and, and, and hoping that the weather is going to be good enough to, for you to catch fish because you don't want to go down there and it just be shit conditions and you don't catch anything or you can't maneuver yourself in a kayak because it's too dangerous. Yeah. Like I want to definitely get into that world more and open that up because the kayak community has really allowed, and we have the Chesapeake Bay. We have the freaking Chesapeake Bay right here. And I think if you learn how to use a kayak properly, it opens up so many opportunities for you. And now that the fact that that pup redfish and trout are now a thing in, in the Chesapeake more and more, because when I was a kid, 
you really didn't hear about a lot of them being caught. And now it's a thing. It is. It is. And it, Thomas, it's, it really is. And, and I have to con- continue to harp on, you know, like that multi-species thing that I kind of absorb as my, as my thing is that, you know, you're either taught how to fish freshwater fishing and, and you kind of, kind of absorb that through the rest of your life, right? You're like, ah, oh, this is how I was taught to catch bass, so on and so forth. You normally are going to become a bass angler. Nothing wrong with that. Bass anglers are awesome. But if you were, just think about it, if you were raised in Virginia Beach and you were taught to fish from a pier with a piece of shrimp on a hook, you know, catching fish from a, from a pier, and that's how your dad taught you. Mm-hmm. Now you're kind of a multi-species angler because yeah. there's no, you're not angling for anything other than a fish, not a specific type of fish. So that guy turns into a multi-species angler. So that's multi-species, kind of species, my... multicultural. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I never thought of it that way. Huh. Yeah, that's kind of my like angle on it. Yeah, because like, I'm, God, I remember when I was a kid, we'd go to docks and stuff and just like whatever, whatever gets on the hook gets on the hook now. Yeah, wow, you've actually opened up my eyes about that. Yeah, it's so freaking cool. There's so many, like, like the one thing I want to do is get somebody on to talk about this this legendary tarpon fishing that happens at, at Chincoteague, too. Yeah. I, I heard rumors, and I'm like, <laughs> I need to know if this is, if it's bullshit or if it's real. <laughs> hey, man, if you, if you hear, whatever you hear, let me know. Yes, because that's I'm just going, so, I'm going there. <laughs> I totally want to catch, I, I would yeah. want to catch one of those from a kayak. That would be, that would be, I don't know about a Cobia. Cobia, I feel like it'd be terrifying. That thing would Co- Kobe, I think, is actually more doable and and manageable and opportunistic for you thomas than um a tarpon i think a tarpon thing in our waters is a little more (laughs) far-reaching than the the cobia thing the cobia thing uh you can catch a cobia i mean that's that's for sure you can definitely catch a cobia tarpon i don't know man that's that's (laughs) that's pretty thick so um you know i try to ask all my guests the first time what are some fish on your wish list that you want to catch? Uh, so besides a snakehead, give anything else on your bucket list that you want to catch this year or just in your lifetime. Yeah. So, um, I got two, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll make it easy. So Cobia has been my fr- Cobia from a kayak has been my thing that I have not been able to do. I've tried, I'm going to try again this year and see what I can do. So that's my number one goal. My other one is, and I think I'm going to actually capture it too easily because I'm going into an area uh, next week with my family for spring break because my kids are off and, and we typically do go to Florida. And uh, But we typically go to Orlando because of Disney. Luckily for me, my children have grown to the point where they have no cares or concerns about Disney. And they just want to go somewhere. So I said, okay, fine. We're going to go someplace where I can go fish really cool places because Orlando is not the place to do that. <laughs> so um, for my number two is I want to catch a shark. That's it. I don't care what kind of shark. Really? I know there's, I know there's a thousand different sharks and I'm going to be living on the, the intercoastal waterways. So for a week, why not bring my kayak down there and see if I can catch a shark? Dude, that shit is gnarly from a kayak. I've watched some people catch them from a kayak. I, I don't know like yeah. how, how they do that thing. It, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to catch fucking Jaws. <laughs> I'm just trying to catch like one I can hold up for my Instagram. <laughs> like do this thing. It's, it's I had um I had a guy. Bounce it around. I don't know. Do, music. Have you ever seen the, um? there's, there's a big saltwater slam that goes out of Ocean City every summer. It's a kayak event. And one of the guys that fished it actually got to go out to Los Bisos in Central America on the Pacific side to do that kayaking offshore thing. And I had him on the show, and it's insane. He said, when you're out there, you have that mothership boat, and they drop you in a kayak. I could not – it sounds cool but scary as shit because he would yeah. say you would be in a wave, and you'd be in the trough, and you have water on either side of you, and you can see a tuna chasing your shark – like a shark chasing the tuna, and the shark's bigger than your damn kayak. And it, it yeah, you're fishing cool. up. It's like it's cool, but like holy crap! I don't know how yeah. people do that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, dude, I, yeah, thank you so much again for coming on tonight. I really appreciate it. And then, guys, again, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today, bringing a little bit more just just the, the different cultures of fishing that are in this area, and you know, giving the snakehead a little bit of love too. Um, yeah. Again, is there anything else that you'd like to plug? Any sponsors or anything like that? No, I mean, we don't have a lot of sponsors. That's kind of one of my things. I don't really want to get, 
I, I, I think I mentioned that earlier. I, my, my goal is to not grow into this, some big thing that, that's supposed to be bigger than life. My goal is to, if I have sponsors, I'm going to give you 1,000% of what I can give you. And to do 1,000% of what I can give you is to stay small. And um, so I won't, I won't go into the sponsor stuff and I won't go into um, anything more than that other than the fact that I love that you asked me to be here, man, and I appreciate everything that you do. And thanks for having me. Well, no, I mean, th- thank you so much for coming on and talking about this. It's hard to, uh, you know, believe it or not, guys, like the only way this show works is you have people that are willing to come on and tell their stories and just talk and give their opinions. And that's hard. And I know with comments and stuff like that, if you want to come on and give your opinions, as long as you're respectful, everyone has stuff to share that everyone could learn from. So come on, say what you want. And that's all you have to say. That's perfectly fine. And again, Joe, thank you so much for coming on to, to talk about this, about the snakeheads. Cause yeah, it's just, it's fascinating. I can get I've had people on that hate them, but it's interesting now that you have this angle where you have a club and then you target them not to kill. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's really cool. That's really cool. But yeah. again, guys like, and subscribe to the channel. I really appreciate it. it helps us out in the algorithm. Please give them a like everything in the episode description. And we'll see you guys next time on fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aaron's and Jared mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's bait and tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.